in case you haven't noticed, but we do have a film camera at the back and we will be filming proceedings for this event as the start of a, a visioning process for the city and, and Linda Blagg behind the camera there, welcome Linda, um, has done a few other filming projects for the city over the years. Um, and of course Linda will be filming throughout this process um, the many community events so at the end of the day we actually have a really good uh, electronic digital film record um, of this process and the outcomes from it. So um, can I please invite um, Mayor Brad Pettit to the stage. The Mayor's going to just set a context for, um, for this session and, and then introduce our keynote speaker. Um, I don't need to probably say anything else. I think uh, Brad is very familiar to you all, so please welcome Mayor Brad Pettit. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, and great to see you all here. This is a really important and special event for the city. And I want to start talking about it just with a reflection. I don't think anyone's ever noticed there's a plaque, a round plaque in the ground underneath the town hall. Next, next time you walk past the town hall under the clock tower, you'll see there's this plaque on the ground. And if you look, have a look at it, it just, had an, well, it just had an anniversary. It's 180th anniversary of celebrating the, what would have been then, the, the town of Fremantle, or maybe not even that, the area of Fremantle's first city plan on the 20th of March, 1833. Uh, and what's fascinating about that, in 1833, Fremantle would have been the roundhouse and a few tents and probably not much else. But they had a really clear plan about the way they wanted the city centre to look. If you look at that plan now, it's exactly how the city centre looks. And for me, that's a really key and interesting point about 180 years on, that plan that someone put together in 1833 actually defined the city that we know and love today. James, who we're coming to speak to in a minute, will be starting off another one of those 1833 processes. Um, because the city that we want to live in, maybe not 180 years' time, but certainly in 20, 50 years' time, is going to be very much defined by the decisions that we make over the next months and years. And we want all of your assistance in actually helping to define what those priorities are and, what, and, what, and what's going to happen. Um, I think I'm really proud of what the council's done over the last few years in terms of redefining, I think we have very strong focus on economic development, there's no doubt about that, and making sure that we do have more people living and working and recreating in Fremantle. And I really feel like we've got those foundations right. But if we're going to be a livable city, a city in which people keep wanting to come to over, over the next decades, then we need to define what it is that, that is going to make that city a great livable place in which, in which people do want to come and play and work and recreate. And I think this is why having a clear sense of where we want to go as a city is going to be really clear in, 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 in defining that. Is there, going to be, is there are huge changes coming. Um, I was just talking with, with my table about a great book that's just come out over the last month called Made in Australia, um, which was by Richard Weller, who wrote Boomtown 2050. And this, in this book, he actually starts to apply it to the whole of Australia and talk about trends over the next the rest of this century, in which we have a... a and James will probably talk about this, sorry if I'm stealing a thunder, but, I mean, but, but we actually have a, a population of 4.7 million people in Perth, and which have 62 million people in Australia. Um, how we do that and how we actually go forward with those huge challenges, is, for me, is going to be a massive challenge, but an exciting one, and um, in many ways, one that's going to be defined by the decisions we make today. So we're very fortunate having James Best, who's going to be talking to you today, but not only doing that, actually helping and working with the city and all of you in leading this process. James will be known to many of you very well already. James was the mayor of South Perth for many years, and um, did. And I must say, I mean, it's certainly a real mentor to me um, when I was an when I first became mayor, and James has been in the job a few years about how to how to be effective in the role and actually to, to get things done. Um, since leaving the city of Perth a couple of years ago, James um, has gone on to form his own business, and he is the managing director of Best Business Communications. Um, and um, I think it's really exciting. James was actually last year awarded the 2012 National Planning Champion Commendation by the Planning Institute of Australia. So we are very gr grateful, James, to have your expertise and your knowledge and your experience to kick us off on this really exciting process and please welcome uh, James to the stage.
Thank you very much, Brad. Um, can everyone hear me at the back? Yes? Um, and over there? So what about here? Can you hear me? Is that OK? Or does it need to be here? Needs to be here, OK. Uh, if you don't hear me, um, lady in the green, wave at me, and that tells me that I've got it down here. So what we're looking at doing is a conversation about what Fremantle will look like tomorrow and for the next 10, 20, 50 years. Some of the magnitude of the challenges that we're going to be facing are absolutely uh, beyond comprehension. Uh, that's not to frighten you, that's really to give you a challenge about how do we um, meet those challenges in the future. We're looking at 2029 is an interesting date because that's when Fremantle will be 200 years old. What we're looking at doing, the, the, the key of this project is to bring everybody together in a conversation about um, where we go and how we do it and to build on our collective visions. So there are lots of stakeholder groups uh, here, there's lots of organisations, the council has a very clear vision, uh, other um, entities uh, community groups, precincts will have an idea about how they want their neighbourhood or their um, organisation or their collective, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and what we need to do is bring people together. So the challenge is, what could tomorrow and the next 50 years be? And so if you're just to close your eyes for a moment and think about um, the last 50 years, uh, 50 years ago, my dad got his first job on St George's Terrace. There were 800,000 people living in the state. He could double park on St George's Terrace <clears throat> and he would leave his keys in the ignition so that if he was next to the kerb, the person in the middle would drive, reverse out, put his car out and on they would go. Uh, we all had key... I mean, I remember growing up, we didn't have our back door locked. Uh, so, if you fast forward to the next 50 years and some of the population projections that Brad was just talking about, this is a massive, massive growth in our state over a very short period of time. I think my dad, uh, who just passed away last year, um, saw phenomenal change in his lifetime. What sort of future do you think our kids and our grandkids, uh, or for some of the younger members of the audience, what do you think that might look like? So we've, we're going to be talking about future conditions, uh, the changing demographics. So we've got a very large baby boomer cohort that are going to be retiring. Uh, we've got massive migration to, um, to help with our um, minerals boom and the question is how long does that last? How resilient is our community to major change or sudden change? Uh, if the supply systems were disrupted, how many hours food do you think we have in our warehouses? 18 hours. So if there was all of a sudden 18 hours food to feed the current 2 million people that are in Perth. Uh, anyone been through a tropical cyclone in Carrara or Port Hedland, you'll know what that means because the shops empty out straight away and there's nothing left on the shelves. What about quality of life? Um, so as we spend our two hours in the car on the, uh, in the traffic jams uh, or there's another water main burst and we all get stuck there um, for the rest of the day, what impact is that having? Living affordability. Will our kids be able to afford to buy a place in the suburb where you're currently living? Or will they need to go 10Ks, 20Ks or even uh, you know, sort of South Bunbury or North um, Bustleton to be able to um, find a place that they can afford. Um, who, who has thought about their retirement plans and thought about how you downsize while you still keep the equity in the family home to allow um, generations to be able to enjoy the quality of life that we have now? So do we have enough super in our accounts? Are we in a position to be resilient as costs keep growing, going up? The bottom line here is that we have increasingly complex problems and the only way that we can talk about them is to do it together um, and decide how we, we need to respond. 
Uh, a very good document has just come out, the state planning strategy. Um, no, that's not chocolate on the front cover. It's actually the Derby mudflats. Uh, it looks much better in real life, the document. Uh, not so good on the screen. Um, it's looking at planning for sustained prosperity. Now, I'm going to show a few graphs. I don't want you to spend too much time trying to read them. It's really just reinforcing the point that I've just made. Um, so the top line is um, the, the area that we'll need to accommodate um, this growing population. So it just keeps spreading north, south and um, east. Uh, the middle graph is the amount of water that we're going to need. And the bottom graph is um, climate change and rainfall patterns. And you can all see that the trends are going the wrong way. Uh, the top graph talks about economic development, the sort of um, opportunities. Uh, will the minerals boom last forever? What will, we be, what will people be doing in the future to earn enough to be able to live in Perth? Who are our trade partners going to be? Um, the next graph talks about the sort of housing styles that have evolved over time and where we need to go in the future. The, the third graph there is the um, sort of traditional urban planning form of um, a, a city. And the bottom graph there is the amount of energy that we're going to require um, to keep a community, a very large community, functioning. Now, these are all, um, you would say the state government will take a conservative approach to this and the bureaucrats aren't known for frightening people, but these are some pretty alarming trends over the next 20 to 50 years. The one that I wanted to spend just a quick moment on, and Brad already touched on it, is the population growth. Now, the, this document says that the high assumption is 5.4 million people, so we're assuming that the oil uh, mining iron ore boom keeps going. Uh, 4.3 million on the uh, projection on the current growth trend, or 3.5 on the low assumption. So that's assuming that um, China gets a cold and uh, the rest of us um, things uh, will be very different to um, what we're currently, how we currently uh, gear our community, our economic development. Th these, um, I think you'd have to say, is a, a very different city to the one that my father um, grew up in. So we've just talked about those issues and I think this again leads us to the need for a community visioning project. <clears throat> Community is a really interesting word, isn't it? Um, uh, the, you might notice that the word, you know, between common and unity, there's a bit of a gap there. W what is our common unity? <coughs> Has everyone had a chance to read Alice in Wonderland? Do you think that... Um, we all know that we've got, you know, the various levels from community groups, stakeholder groups, businesses, local government, state government, the national government. Do you think we've, we're sort of operating in that paradigm? <clears throat> so, I mean, does it really matter which way we go? Can we just do business as usual? Can we continue doing what we're doing now? I think you'd have to say that the magnitude of the challenges that face us um, are really, it's going to be a big job, but we're all going to have to do it together. It's the only way that we're going to be able to get a path through where we don't have this uh, division between the fors and the againsts. So, what we're looking at doing is investing in community visioning and I think it's a, a fantastic that the Fremantle City Council has decided to facilitate this process um, and they've asked me to lead it, which is, is a, a great um, privilege and we're going to have some fun together. It's going to be a really good conversation about what we can do to prepare for the future. Why do you think we should be doing this? Uh, I think it's about planning for the future but it also needs to be of the people, for the people, by the people. If we have this ownership, we have the commitment and the, and the buy-in of the outcomes of these conversations, we're going to have le a lot less friction in our community about where do we do things, how do we change things, and over what time frame. Uh, there's a proverb which says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Margaret Wheatley, famous anthropologist, said there is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. So, you know, the question is, what do people in Fremantle care about? 
that's going to be one of our first um, conversations, and I'll talk in a minute about the process that I'm um, we're suggesting. Charles Darwin said, "It is not the, str the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change." Um, so. I think I've explained in the first part of this presentation that change is inevitable. The scale of it is daunting, but it is possible um, to adapt. I, I like Larson because I think he sort of sums up that in this case, <coughs> it, it's a jungle out there. Um, does anyone have a road map for the next 50 years? Does anyone know what that path might be? There are multiple paths through the jungle. So the question is, how do we all together work out uh, without the leader falling into a man trap? Uh, that, could also, that could be the mayor strung up there. <laughs> it could also be the community of Fremantle. It could also be the city of Perth strung up there because there are risks. We know that there are very significant risks that we're going to need to address. Um, but the point is that unless, um, the pe sorry, <coughs> unless the rest of the team are with us on that journey, we don't know that we've got the collective wisdom to be able to address some of these issues. Fremantle Council, uh, the City of Fremantle, have been doing a lot of work over the last couple of years to look at what the foundations are to ensure that we do have a brighter future. Um, so we've got the, the strategic plan. We've got the economic development strategy, the low carbon city plan, We've got amendment 38 for the East End and an amendment, um, I haven't got my eyes on there, 49. Um, <laughs> amendment 38 for East End and amendment 49 for the city centre. So w this is putting it in context that we're not actually starting from a blank sheet of paper. We've got some great foundations, but we can't build on them without everybody in this room and everybody who lives in Fremantle, and so that's the CBD and the suburbs, to then take these and build on them. So the question today is really how do you create a livable, vibrant and sustainable city for the 21st century? So I, I bet each and every one of you would love to be sustainable in how you live your life and how you move around and um, what you do. The question is sometimes we feel a bit um, helpless or hopeless as an individual. It's not until we all get together um, that we can actually affect change and we can create, we can truly create a livable, vibrant, sustainable city. And I'll be talking about Portland next, about what they've done, which is if anyone, just show of hands, anyone that's been to Portland? <clears throat> so a few, okay, great. The, the model <clears throat> the model that we're going to use um, is actually the Portland, Oregon, it's known as the Oregon visioning model and it essentially takes futures uh, as vision creation and adds ideation, which is the Latin word for idea generation and communication and together this is the model that will, is most effective in actually having a conversation, um, a very difficult conversation that will often polarise people. But in Portland, they've been able to do it without the usual angst that we, we see in Australian cities or Australian suburbs. Um, Australia's had a bit of a tradition. Um, you know, Canberra and Adelaide were, um, had somebody had a vision. Um, in Fremantle, Brad said 1833, they laid out the city um, structure. And so we know that we can do it. The question is how do you retrofit into an existing place? When it's a green field, it's really easy. You can say, well, you know, it's urban planner's dream. The difficulty that we're going to be experiencing is that we've already got an urban built form. Uh, we've already got people in existing communities. How do they feel about change and how do they feel about these things being either superimposed on them uh, or them deciding what the change will look like? So we're going to, uh, today is the, uh, the first kickoff and we've deliberately chosen the Fremantle Leaders Luncheon to do that. In a month's time, we'll be having an open community conversation and then four workshops. Essentially, uh, workshop number three will be looking at the future that we want to create and what it will look like. We're not going to discuss that straight up because we need to be a bit more informed and educated. We need to understand what some of the drivers might be. 
Obviously, one of the and this will be the first workshop. The key driver is what is it that we want to protect? What are the values of Fremantle that are so special that during this period of change, we're not going. We're going to protect them. We'll also need the second workshop. We'll be talking about um, some of the things that we'll need to do to respond to the challenges. So we need to be flexible. But what are some of the key projects which will have a transformative effect on Fremantle? The last workshop will be what actions are we all going to take? So it's not a case of abrogating our responsibility to the council or to the state government or to the Australian government. It's about us, each and every one of us. If we all do a little bit and we all put our shoulder to the wheel, it's going to be much easier to get things moving. And this really becomes the blueprint. So it's a very simple process. The Oregon model just has those four steps. What we're hoping is that the convers this conversation and the outcomes will be a map to the future. The first really important point to make is that this is about bringing together all of the stakeholder vision. So we know that lots of stakeholders and organisations and um, governments have visions but they're all in silos at the moment. We want to get them out of their organisations and to put them in the room so that we can all see them and we can see them in context. We want partnership approach to identify the opportunities and a collective view of what matters. A collective view of what matters. What does matter? What matters in Fremantle? What matters in Fremantle's connection with the city of Perth or in the greater metropolitan Perth? And we want to do this as, as a sense of us together. Uh, so it's not the enlightened leader or dictator saying this is what we're going to do because we know that that's an uns unsustainable model. We, want, we will be facilitating wide scale community conversations on our preferred shared future. And the, the trick to this is to then have some key transformative projects that will bring the visions into reality. And so these will be created, nurtured uh, and outcomes delivered by community groups, business groups um, and key stakeholders. But again, within the umbrella of what the overall vision is. We'll be involving everyone in creating a shared plan of actions for a brighter future for Fremantle. The out one of the outcomes will be building engagement and the capacity of the community. The other point, point seven, is that we don't want a plan that's going to sit on the shelf. I mean, how many great ideas and, you know, blueprints and Bibles and, you know, action plans are just all this work goes into a document that then sits on a shelf somewhere. This has to be an active document. It's going to be reviewed regularly and in that we're looking at an annual community summit, which is something they do in Portland. They get 250 people. Uh, the key, you know, the chairs and leaders of the, all the various groups come together and they share what they've been doing over the last 12 months. And they also show, share the linkages between each of the, um, the plans. So the stages, um, the four stages are there and then the fifth stage will be the annual community summit. Um, these slides will be up on the website soon, so don't, you don't have to... I know there's a few too many words on there, um, Jason. I, I did uh, add a few extras, but I think it's important so people can see um, the various stages. Jason said only one sentence per slide, but there's a few more than that. Um, the, the methodology we'll be using at each of the workshops is multiple conversations around key themes. We'll be asking people for their, the, the groups, the syndicates, big idea and also for the quick win. Uh, because we need to start, you know, we st the council started, you know, a, a couple of years ago. Tomorrow we need to start the conversations about what can we do, what are the lighter, quicker, cheaper things that we can do right now to make Fremantle a better place. But then longer term for the big idea. We'll be looking, uh, creating opportunities for people to come together to foster a genuine sense of engagement and belonging. And the conversations will be through community forums, the digital media, social media. So thanks to Linda up the back. You'll be seeing a lot of Linda. Um, she might even ask you for a quick response to what you think about today's um, launch and what you think about the visioning in the future. One of the things is we can have this conversation in this room, but how do the people walking on the street or taking kids to school 
or getting dinner ready for tonight, how do we connect with them? How do they be part of this conversation? So we'll be looking for very innovative ways to touch everybody in Fremantle over the next 18 months that this project will run. Uh, we'll also be mapping the Plexus. Um, a Plexus is a network of networks, and so they're just, I've just thrown some groups that we, that we already know about. We'll find others out there along the way. And the idea is to get all of those groups talking to all of the other groups. Um, and again, we'll be doing that through um, uh, social media and an interactive website. Uh, my last, uh, you'd be pleased to know that um, we'll finish on some quick examples because I'm sure you're saying, look, this is great rhetoric, but you know, it's a lot of work. Is it really sustainable? Is it actually going to make a difference? And the answer is yes. And I just wanted to quickly touch on some of the things that might, uh, um, some of the outcomes we might expect. I mean, the first principle is that this needs to be fun and creative. People need to want to come to these discussions or they want to need to log on to um, the digital media. We need to talk about feasible ideas. So it's no point saying that, you know, Fremantle's future is a rocket launching facility and it's going to be based down there in King Square. I mean, clearly it's not going to work. So we need to make sure that these are things that can be done. Practical outcomes, but with long-term thinking in place. Sorry, Graham, I didn't mean to provide that as an idea. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, central, my central thesis is that the journey needs to be as important as the destination. So it's no point saying um, in 2050 at three o'clock we'll know we've arrived because we will see the rocket launching facility in King Square. The journey has to be important, doesn't it? The, you know, it needs to be a sense of connection. It needs to be a sense of why. Why do we live in Fremantle? What is it, what's our meaning about Fremantle? What's our meaning about the future? <coughs> what I'm, and I've done this now, this will be my third, fourth major uh, community visioning exercise in the last couple of years. And um, those are the key themes, the sense of place, strength of community, the importance of the environment, housing and transport choices. That, they'll be some of the key outcomes, but I'm sure there'll be other things that uh, in Fremantle will have special or unique features about whether it's the heritage of the building or um, the connection with the port or economic opportunity. So there'll be, these will be quite um, substantial themes that will emerge. And in every case, even in the Portland model, those key themes emerged. The, the, the clever bit is getting the plexus connected with the themes. So around the outside, and I've deliberately represented each of those themes as a, as a interlocking pieces of an overall theme because you can't talk about housing and transport options without talking about the environmental impact. You can't talk about sense of place unless it's connected with economic development or, or whatever it is. So then we'll be, so rather than just uh, the council or the state government having a conversation in their chambers, we'll be having these conversations um, led by each of the groups around there, you know, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, PCYC, Sporting Clubs, Youth Advisory Council, um, uh, Street Champions, the Walking School Bus, I mean, there's a whole list of groups there that um, could potentially be part of this conversation and this is the universal approach that we're looking for. My second thesis is that the power of visioning does actually create an optimism for change. Portland. 40 years ago, Portland was in a very difficult place. So just quickly, the, um, the picture on your right um, gives you a sense of what Port Portland looks like today. Uh, a dense urban core with a green belt and an agricultural belt as well. The, their population growth was um, very similar to ours except after 1960 when the population plateaued. So ours kept up on a, on a steady graph. Why was that? Uh, a lot of American cities had the urban blight. Um, people were moving out of the cent city centre and moving out to the suburbs. So you had these um, um, shopping centre malls and boxes and community neighbourhoods where people were basically leaving the city centre. 
things got so bad that um, the population actually started going backwards in the, um, in the late 60s and the, the council decided that that was unsustainable, something needed to happen. So they started a, using the Oregon visioning model and um, Stephen Ames pioneered that. Um, I know Brad's met um, with um, Stephen. And uh, Stephen was the town planner, the, the chief town planner for the Portland City Council. He started, he, so he tried to engage people and said, come and talk to me about what you'd like to see the city centre looking like as they were all leaving. He couldn't get people to have a conversation about what the city centre would look like. His answer was, let's get a visioning model about long-term thinking about what Portland could be. Uh, interestingly, the farmers then were starting to say, well, hang on, this urban growth, this suburbanisation, this spread, this sprawl that's happening is actually building over our agricultural land. And the recreation industry, which is a very large component, so the state forests of um, Oregon are just fantastic, a really amazing place to go and visit. They were also being chopped down uh, to accommodate a growing population. Uh, so houses were going on where the very factor that got people to Portland in the first place, which is their magnificent um, forests. I mean, it would never happen in Perth, would it, where we would actually get the, the government to legislate an urban growth boundary. Don't worry too much about the words because you can look at these slides afterwards. But the other point here is that um, they invested significantly in the infrastructure. So having decided what they wanted to do, they then started investing in infrastructure. So you had 77, the Portland Metro in... Um, gosh, I should put my glasses on, shouldn't I? Um, 1986, the Max Light Rail opened. Max Light Rail, sound familiar? Then in 2001, a streetcar service also opened. So you've got, and these are three different types of transport systems, which means that the cars, there's, and there's, there's a picture of there, that's a streetcar, that's right in the, the heart of Portland. So they've preserved and protected all their heritage buildings. They've built new ones to accommodate a growing population. Um, there's a picture of the, um, the forests, which everybody agreed needed protecting. So the vision was, let's protect the agricultural land, let's protect the forests. What's the answer? The answer is a, 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 an urban growth boundary that we won't cross. As a consequence, we needed to start thinking about increasing the density in key locations connected by good public transport. Um, you can see there, um, again, the, um, the picture on the right is the, um, the light rail that goes out to the suburbs and um, a thriving, bustling um, CBD, um, which has reversed the trend. What's happening now in Portland, it's the choice place to live. If, you, if you're mobile in the States, you'd be wanting to try and head to Portland. Now, the, the key point about this is that this has actually been a 40-year vision, hasn't it? Because in the 1960s, the, the council and the community were talking about what Portland could look like in the future. And each and every year, they've been adding to that vision. The baton gets passed on from one mayor to the next, to one state governor to the next. So they've all got the common vision. And what each successive government will then do is add their bit to the, to the picture. This is a long-term approach. Um, and it does provide those foundations for decision making now. Um, I think in a way, Perth's, the, the challenge there was that they had the freedom to do that because they hadn't already built on their agri agricultural land. They hadn't built on Spearwood and Wanneroo. They hadn't started um, chewing up into um, the state forests and you know, fruit and market garden, orchards and those things. But it was also the courage of the leadership because they knew that the community's vision was that big, big picture. Uh, visioning has also brought in Perth. Um, visioning brought together the five councils, a couple of universities, the hospitals to advance the Knowledge Arc light rail. And i um, pleased to say now that the MAX light rail system incorporates that um, at stage two. Visioning brought together the 21 councils on the rivers. Um, so we've now got the Swan Canning Rivers Charter. And um, would it surprise you to realise that in 150 years of responsible government in Western Australia, the 21 councils had never come together? So our icon is the Swan Canning River, and yet we've never had the people making the decisions, the organisations, come together about a vision for what it will look like. 
Um, as a consequence, we've got uh, all 21 mayors signed the charter. There's a vision there and there are some objectives and sitting behind that is a funding strategy, an $800 million funding strategy to get the river back to when it was known as the Durbel Yerrigan. Directions 2031 and beyond has set some very ambitious targets about what um, the um, densities of Perth could look like. Um, I'm not sure they're mandated in the Directions 2031. I'm, no, but they're so strong, they are mandated. Um, so, you know, the challenge is if you've been allocated um, in South Perth's case 6,000 additional um, dwellings, where are you going to put them? Who would want, who would welcome um, 6,000 people moving into the street next to them? Not too many of us. Um, and certainly some of the conversations have, have been, you know, challenging. But essentially because 1,400 residents came together to discuss the long-term future, what the opportunities and challenges would be, and 900 um, submissions, of which they were overwhelmingly positive, we're now looking at um, concentrating development in South Perth around transport nodes, so that's Canning Bridge, the Mill Point Precinct and Curtin Town. And so you wouldn't have heard too much controversy about those um, key projects. Uh, you might have on the Melville side of because Janet Woolard needed to be relevant and I'm hoping <laughs> that now um, she will see that actually the, the community has had a proper conversation about what, um, where development needs to go and what it needs to look like. There are the examples, just the last couple of slides. Um, outcomes from the community visioning, we're hoping that we'll get a sense of meaning. So what does it mean to live in Fremantle? What will keep us here? What will keep our kids here? A unity of purpose, an agreement on the priorities, and community progress with these transformative projects. Just on the agreement of priorities, there are going to be some difficult investment and funding decisions that are going to be required over the next year, five, ten years. And what, what do we invest in? What are the priorities? Given that the council and the state government have a limited bucket of money and we don't have a magic wand, what are we going to decide to fund on? Now, this visioning will actually help us budget um, and also give us some resource implications of some of the big projects that need to happen. So if we need a light rail system in Fremantle, which I think is inevitable, or we want to better connect the CBD with the port or some big decisions that are required, this will actually help guide those decisions. So it's incredibly valuable and important that you all get involved in that. The bottom line is that we need to increase capacity, community capacity to work through the inevitable dilemmas and tensions together. So we're also hoping that through this process we'll have less of a fight about what happens and why. We won't get people polarised into a corner saying, I'm going to light... I, I hear it all the time, I love light rail, just don't put it in my street. Um, the timetable, again, it's a bit, uh, a bit busy up on that slide, but you can see that here we are in April talking about um, launching the briefings. On Thursday the 16th of May we're looking at the community launch so make a mental note of that now. Get out your phones or your iPads or any of you that's still got a pen in your pocket, make a note. Um, then we'll do the four visioning workshops in one in June, one in July, one in August and one in September and each of the successive workshops feed off the previous ones. We're looking at having a community summit in February, so it's, there's going to be a lot of information. Some of the groups will, or it will take off, so I'm expecting precinct groups and chambers of commerce and those groups, uh, the Fremantle Union, off you'll go, um, to then come back in February to report back on conversations, outcomes, progress, whatever. Uh, we'll have local place-based visioning workshops, so that will be in the suburbs, precinct groups, um, kindy groups, daycare groups, sporting clubs, churches, whatever, whoever wants to get involved, the more the merrier. And then annually look at a community group visioning summit just to keep, by, you know, it's a bit of a, uh, an accountability and transparency that we need to see what the groups are doing and that will then share and spark ideas with other groups. Now, um, you're going to have to work for your lunch. I need you to do something for me. Tell everyone about the visioning launch on May 16. I would like you, as a minimum, 
to phone or to visit 10 people in your network and tell them, no, in fact, you have to do everything to get them to come to the launch on the 16th of May. You're in very fortunate and privileged position to be here today to, to get a really good understanding of what we're doing. We need you to get people enthusiastic and fired up to come to the 16th of May. Even better is if you can get to network, network coordinators. So these are your, you know, the, the captain of the netball team or the president of the cricket club or church pastors or people that have got a very wide network already. What we're hoping is that by the 16th of May, everybody in Fremantle will have had at least one phone call. They might get two, three or four phone calls from people. And so we're taking a viral approach to communicating this message and you guys are initiating it. Now, the really important job is that you then have to tell those people that you've contacted to do the same with their networks. And on it goes ad, ad infinitum. So please tell family, friends and colleagues about this visioning exercise and how important it is. Invite your network to the launch and to the visioning workshops. Um, so get your work colleagues to come in. Go and tell your neighbours about this. The bottom, the bottom line there is that if there was only one thing that you're going to participate in this year, exclude all other invitations and appointments. Keep this one in your diary. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. Um, very informative. Now, we do have about 10 minutes to probably for questions, if anybody has any, uh, directed towards James. Uh, there, yeah, there is a microphone running around. Yep. Just uh, tell us your name and, uh, and James yes, will try and answer. My name is yeah, John Bird. I'm, I have to ask a question because I get told off if I don't. Um, I think we've all been to... Uh, to workshops on things where you have tables and big pieces of paper and everybody writes down their ideas and, and um, often they get, um, can I say hijacked? No, anyway, often they get uh, used by certain community groups to, to uh, further their particular ends. At the end of the day, isn't this just going to be a decision of the elected, elected representatives? And then isn't the process of what you're talking about just trying to remove some of the roadblocks to those decisions that the elected representatives are going to make? Did, did you listen to my story about Portland? <laughs> so in, in Portland's case, the, the community leaders 40 years ago um, facilitated a genuine conversation about what Portland would look like. Much as in 1833, when the father, forefathers and mothers of uh, Fremantle set out the grid and started that conversation. So, you know, the point is that, um, look, it, it, is it is possible that um, small um, groups might try to hijack the conversation. But because everybody in Fremantle is going to be part of that conversation, we'll get a true sense of what the priorities are. It, it's impossible for a small group to hijack this process because it is so big and because it is the universal, um, the social media, the digital media, community conversations. Look, as a former mayor, I can tell you that if somebody came in um, to a community group and tried to hijack it, at the end of the visioning, the community said, listen, we don't want to hear what you're against. We want to hear what you're for. And it, it works. Um, there's one here. Yeah. Right, yeah. Thanks very much. I, I was just wondering how you keep people's confidence in the process when I guess this follows on from the last question and that is that people can be cynical about this sort of consultative, consultative process and also when people are feeling so strongly about the state of Fremantle at the moment. The, um, one of the challenges with community engagement is that organisations will go and say, tell us what you think about X, and then we get the feedback, put it in the box, the lid goes on, and then it goes on the shelf, and nothing much happens. Um, and unfortunately, our politicians are particularly good at um, taking a cynical approach to have that authentic conversation. 
I can say that the count, I've met with the council now twice informally and I've been talking to many um, councillors informally over the last couple of weeks. They all have a genuine commitment that this is an authentic bottom-up approach and it's not going to work in the long term if we take shortcuts or we try and um, super, superimpose some outcomes that the community don't strongly believe in. It's also why the very first um, workshop is talking about the values of what people love about Fremantle. What's the meaning for people who live in Fremantle? What are the, what are the aspects that we need to protect and enhance? So once we've got a, a, you know, sort of a universal understanding about the things that we protect, in the subsequent workshops, and we can then along the way inform and educate people about, you know, some of the, the challenges that are going to be ahead. Business as usual, I mean, does anybody here in the room believe that business as usual is going to, is going to deliver the outcomes? I mean, if we just keep going the way we are, do you think that's going to get the outcomes that we want? Um, over there, Victoria. Sorry. <laughs> Let me... It sounds like Portland um, reached a point of crisis, as did a number of other American centres and cities. And just as the people of Portland had the motivation to do something about that, so did they in various other places. And people like Ruth Durack, a Western Australian architect, worked extensively in America uh, with other communities because they had a crisis and therefore an, an emergency and a motivation. Do we have a crisis? And is there the motivation is really the point that is going to be key to whether this process works here? Look, I, I don't think that our crisis is profound as Portland or some of the other American cities. They had a slightly different approach to um, letting their town centres go, essentially. They became ghost towns and, um, you know, very dysfunctional places. I, I, Australian cities hasn't, haven't got to that point. But I'd say that, you know, when I look, what, what actually got me interested in this conversation was when I thought about my kids and whether my wife and I on modest incomes could actually afford to have them close. I mean, we were a tight-knit family. We don't want our kids living in Wanneroo or Coburn. We want them close to where we are. My parents um, have... My, yeah, well, some people don't like their kids being too close, but uh, and I do. <laughs> uh, for some people, it's get them out as quick as possible. Um, the other question is when my parents um, retired. Um, the money was in the family home, a very nice home in, in Claremont. And the question was, do we keep it or do we then sell it to allow them to move into retirement homes? And what impact did that have on the, me and my three brothers? Um, because that's actually, you know, this intergenerational idea of the family assets being passed down. The problem is, is that, um, you know, when they bought the house in Claremont, it was $87,000. What, what would you reckon an average price of a house in Claremont is now? Two million. So the, the question is, does Fremantle become so unaffordable that our young people and our retiring, and it's a growing baby boomer cohort, where do they retire to? Does that mean they actually need to leave Fremantle? So the very reason that you live here, you've probably, you know, you know your parents might have been born here, you've gone to school here, you've lived here. Can you sustain your lifestyle as an individual living in Fremantle? If we don't look at these difficult decisions and start making the planning provisions now, by the time it comes to actually hard decisions, it will be too late and it will be a pitched battle between those that are nice and comfortable and relaxed and say, look, I love the idea of um, increasing or having a vibrant and livable Fremantle, but just don't move anyone in next to me. Um, so we, there, I think that there are some very significant challenges. I mean, just providing water to our growing community. When you look at the step decline in rainfall over the time, you look at the, um, our economic development, we've got all our eggs into mining and resource bucket. What happens if the world decides that they're going to do something different? Uh, where, where is our clever and our smart? We always pride ourselves on being innovative. I, I remember when... You know, my um, great-great-grandparents pushed their wheelbarrow across the Nullarbor in the 1870s. That was to come for the Jarrah boom, and then it was in the mining in the gold boom. So there's always been reasons for people to come here. The question is what keeps them here, and actually what provides a really good quality of life. Okay. Down the front here, Victoria. Thanks. 
How are you? Um, I believe Portland's a standalone city, is that, is that right? Yeah, in, in, go on, yep. Yeah, and uh, I just, um, at the risk of being thrown out of the meeting and the city, um, you know, Fremantle <laughs> is a very important place to all West Australians and all people living in Perth. A lot of people outside of the city use it for recreation and, and um, there's a great attachment to Fremantle throughout the state. So I'm just asking whether you, in the process you have room for that kind of external consultation. <laughs> Okay, um, so one of um, Portland's other challenges is that um, you might have heard of Seattle, where Boeing and um, Intel and uh, Microsoft, is Microsoft in um, Seattle? So all of the young people were leaving Portland to go up to Seattle, and all the clever and arty ones were heading south to San Francisco. So Portland was sort of in the middle as a nice little resort town where it's a great place to go and see the trees, the forests, fantastic forests. So, you know, it was an unsustainable model. They needed things for people to do in their local town. Um, so that, that's Portland's situation. Is that they had external, they had internal factors. So the, the, the town centre was dying, but at the same time, people were being pulled out of Portland to Seattle and to San Francisco. Um, in terms of your second part of the question, which was um, the conversation with the neighbouring um, communities about what they see for Fremantle, um, certainly I know Mick McCarthy's here from the Southwest Group, which is um, Coburn, Rockingham, Quinana, Fremantle, Mel. Melville and East Fremantle. So there is uh, opportunity for a strategic approach. We'll certainly be going to talk to the neighbouring councils um, facilitated through the South West Group about what does this mean uh, if Fremantle can become the hub, what impact does... How do we get those connections with the neighbouring councils? Well, I think... Uh, one over there. Last question. Um, yep, last question. Um, I just wanted to know, in the very first sort of workshop where we ask, or you ask, um, what is it about Fremantle that we want to keep, how do we get us Fremantleites to actually focus on that rather than telling you what we don't want? <laughs> um, because I'll be asking you what you love. What do you love about Fremantle? Now, love and hate don't, don't always go together. So if people do come and talk to me about what they hate, I'll be saying, look, thank you very much, but we're here to talk about what we love. I want you to tell, tell us... What, well, I want you to tell everybody about what we're for, not what we're against. And it's worked really well in the three um, visioning exercises I've done in WA before this one. And um, the work... I've got a strategic alliance with Stephen Ames out of Portland, so he and I Skype regularly and we talk about just, you know, how do you run the process, how, does, how do you make it work. Um, and it's really interesting that when you start getting people to focus about what they're passionate about and what they love, you get very few haters in the room and if they do, um, they get quickly asked by the rest of the group, look, we're here in a positive and productive conversation. We don't want to go back to the old paradigm about, you know, lying in the ditch um, or picketing the whatever you're trying to do. It's really about getting people engaged because they have a sense of meaning of the place. And, you know, when, if you've been in Fremantle for a long time, you'll pretty much know the sort of things that keep you here or maybe the reasons got your parents or your grandparents here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, and James, um, just thanks for that. And can I ask you to show your appreciation in the normal way? Now, just before we wrap up, um, a couple of points. And I, my first point is I have a really humble apology to make. Um, I failed to recognise the Honourable Lynn McLaren, MLC. Um, my apologies, Lynn. Um, I didn't see you on my guest list, so my apologies and welcome. Um, just a couple of points. I mean, the, the thrust of the questions. Um, I guess the sense we were trying to actually give here is that this is a really comprehensive community debate and discussion. This is not a superficial short and sharp discussion. This will be an ongoing one that will last for a long time and it will address a number of things, um, both within the Fremantle CBD and, and the greater Fremantle area. Uh, and the word common unity or community, as James rightly pointed out, isn't just the residents of Fremantle. Um, community in Fremantle is all stakeholders and it does include um, the tourist, tourism sector. Now, clearly, you know, we're not going to interview and, and engage one-time visitors from China or, 
or Eastern Europe or Western Europe or anywhere else for that matter, but to actually understand, I guess, the needs of the tourism sector is going to be an important part of the conversation. Um, as will indeed, I mean, there are, there are now the, the Council has made it really clear um, over the last four years that it has a pretty clear vision about what's important to it, uh, in terms, particularly in terms of the Fremantle CBD, whilst holding on to the values that have been articulated by many councils over the last 20 years here. Um, but that's primarily been focused around economic development, as the Mayor rightly pointed out. But there are still a number of unresolved um, debates and questions for Fremantle um, if it is to move forward in a unified way. Um, some scenarios need to be thought about. Um, it occurs to me that uh, it was a population of 4.5 million in, by 2050, when we currently have a population in Perth of about 1.8, that um, traffic congestion is a significant issue. Um, you know, the question was asked uh, about, you know, you know can, we, can we do this? But, you know, ten years ago, somebody talked about traffic congestion in Perth, you would have laughed. Uh, you would have only had to go to Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, and you would have laughed. If you went anywhere else in the world, particularly in Asia, you would have really laughed at Perth's traffic congestion. But ten years on, it's significantly different. Now, I know 20 or 30 years ago, when groundbreaking people like Professor Peter Newman um, first started to alert us to uh, peak oil and, and the impacts of that. Uh, my response was, well, I figure that technology will come to the fore and, and there'll still be cars around because it won't be a problem, but they'll just be powered alternatively. And that has, in fact, starting to happen. The problem with that is that it, it actually allows us not to make a decision about our transport needs. It allows us not to make a decision to get, on, to get on the bandwagon and really push hard for public transport. Because if indeed cars are powered by alternative means and we're going to have three times the volume of cars on our roads, I don't know where they're going to go or how you're going to get to where you want to go in a hurry because they're not going to happen. Um, we need to start thinking about things like uh, what happens if the port is actually relocated out of, out of Fremantle? What scenario would we prefer to have in Fremantle without a port? And it's a discussion that needs to be had. We've got a, a drying climate. Everyone knows the water restrictions and the water issues are significant within Western Australia and particularly in the Perth metro area and the predictions are for a drying climate. Um, what do we do about our green spaces? What are our new public spaces going to look like? Are they going to be green? And if they are, how is that going to be maintained with a, with a drying climate? They're all issues and they're all the sorts of discussions I think that will we'll, come out of this um, community engagement uh, envisioning session. And I really sincerely look forward to this. I really sincerely hope that everyone will be engaged. And as James probably didn't quite point out quite so uh, significantly, but, but over 10% of South Perth's population participated in and engaged in that exercise in South Perth. If we can achieve that, um, that's a couple of thousand people. Uh, and that's a significant input into our process, and it does mean that we capture the needs and the aspirations of a broad sector of the community. So on that note, um, just to, uh, that was just a bit of a wrap up from me uh, to just, I guess, try and reinforce the key points of, of where, what this conversation is actually about.